Uh, today's topic is uh, responding to reactions uh, and basically it's about how we look at people of this world, how they react to our beliefs, our lives and our words and how to uh, respond uh, in, a, in a godly way and not get influenced by the uh, praises of people or criticism of people, but rather keep our head on all situations and keep on serving God. Now we have this amazing a promise of God, uh, where it says in 2 Corinthians, in chapter 2, uh, 14, 15, 16, that Paul writes, and thanks be to God who always leads us in a triumphal position in Jesus Christ. Triumphal position in Jesus Christ. And through us spreads everywhere the fragrance of the knowledge of him. For we are to God the aroma of Christ among those who are saved and among those who are perishing. To one of the smell of death, other the fragrance of life. And who is equal to such a task? What Paul is saying here is that wherever we go, through us, God spreads the fragrance of the gospel. Wherever we go. Because wherever we go, he lives in us. That's why there is no uh, God forsaken place. Sometimes people say, no, it's a God forsaken place. It's a hard ground for evangelists. Difficult ground. No ground is too difficult for God. Because uh, he fills heaven and earth and uh, wherever we go, he goes. And the amazing promise of God is that wherever we go, we spread the freedom of the gospel and uh, wherever we go and uh, through us, he spreads the spreading of the gospel. And uh, for we are to God the aroma of Christ. We are to God the aroma of Christ. I'm always amazed by this aroma of Christ, uh, how we are to God. The context of, you know, just imagine if you were in a Bible study 2,000 years ago, in a small little town, say Kafarnaum, in, uh, in Israel, the Lord is preaching in a small little cottage. Imagine the amazing atmosphere there would be there little people little sitting inside and the uh, aroma of holiness, love, compassion, uh, amazing grace, humility, aroma of Christ, atmosphere of Christ. And uh, imagine how it would be to actually be in a Bible study where Jesus himself is preaching. And uh, just imagine for a moment how it would be. But the Bible says actually we are to God the aroma of Christ. What an amazing privilege it is. And, and through us, he leads, he leads us in a triumphal possession in Jesus Christ. What's his possession? Triumphal possession in Jesus Christ. I mean, understand the context of this word possession. You know, in those days, uh, when the people went to war in all these uh, cities and countries, when they uh, win the war and come back home, uh, they come in a procession. At the, head, at the head of the position will be the heroes of the war. All the valiant uh, the, the, the soldiers who were heroes of the war, they will be right in the front. And as the whole position enters the city, uh, they'll all be cheering. People lying on both sides. They'll be cheering the heroes. And they'll be triumphant in the front. And the whole city will be cheering all these uh, soldiers uh, who are heroes of the war coming back home after winning the war. It will be a triumphal procession for the people. Now, the Bible says, God leads us in a triumphal position in Jesus Christ. And through us spreads everywhere the fragrance of knowledge of him. So actually, we are also in a war, in a spiritual war. And as we are sensitive to God's spirit, and we move in step with the spirit, wherever we go, God will use us to win souls for him. Because in us is Christ. Through us, God spreads everywhere the fragrance of the knowledge of God. And uh, he reveals Christ in us. This is what the Apostle Paul wrote to the church in Galatia. Churches in Galatia. Galatians chapter 1 from verse 15. says, uh, there he writes, For God, who set me apart from birth, and call me by his grace, was pleased to reveal his son in me. Then I preached among the Gentiles. I didn't consult any man. God was pleased to reveal 
his son in me, he says, in me. The Apostle Paul knew fully well that Christ lives in him. He was fully aware of that, never forgot that. In Galatians 2.20 he writes, I have been crucified with Christ. I no longer live, but Christ lives in me. And the life I now live in the body, I live by faith, the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. So as we realize that, uh, God is so pleased with us as we are faithful to the gospel. He spread the gospel through us wherever we go. There's no, as I said, no God forsaken place because he reveals Christ in us to people of this world. So we are victorious. We are more than conquerors through him who loved us. Now the interesting thing is, for God, we are the aroma of Christ. And where we go, we are triumphant before the Lord because they're fulfilling God's purpose for our lives. But for the world, we're not at the head of the position. You know what used to happen those days? When the people come back from war, in the right and the front will be the heroes of the war, soldiers. At the, at the end of the position will be the prisoners of war. All the people captured by the valiant soldiers will be the end of the position. The front will be the heroes. And the right behind will be the prisoners of war. So as the whole position enter the city, they'll all be cheering the heroes. And when it comes to the end of the position, they'll mock, they jeer, and uh, make fun of the prisoners of war in the end. Now, why the Apostle Paul wrote to the church in Corinth about how we are in a triumphal position in Christ, we are in the right in the front. If you look at 1 Corinthians 4 chapter, from 9 to 13. Can, can you please switch off your uh, videos, please? It's disturbing. Please switch off your videos. A lot of movement is there. We can mute your videos. It will help. Thank you. In 1 Corinthians 4 chapter, verse from 9 to 13, Paul writes, For it seems to me that God has put us at the end of the procession as those are condemned to die in the arena. You see, God has put us at the end of the procession. That is where, where the prisoners of war are there, who would be jeered, mocked by the people in the city. It seems to me he's put at the end of the procession like men condemned to die in the arena. He has made a spectacle to the universe, to angels, and to men. We are fools for Christ, but you also Wise in Christ. We are fools, but you are wise. We are weak, but you are strong. You are honored, we are dishonored. He goes on to explain how, when they were uh, actually uh, persecuted, they endured. When they were cursed, they blessed them. And when they were slandered, they spoke kindly in response. Just imagine. And then he goes on to say in verse 13, in 13, we are the refuse of the world, the scum of the earth. Refuse of the world, the scum of the earth, the apostles. For God, at the head of the procession, heroes. For the world, at the end of the procession, mocked, jeered, scum of the earth, refuse of the world. When people uh, insulted them, when they, when they uh, cursed them, the people blessed in return. When they persecuted, they endured. When they were slandered, they spoke kindly. That's a response of these people to the common people. But before God, they were heroes. So the question is, how do we look at ourselves? Do we look at ourselves as heroes in the world or do we look at ourselves as people or heroes for God, fulfilling his purpose? And then that happens, we will face jeering, mocking, slandering, cursing, a spectacle to the universe, to angels, and to people. That's what Paul says. God has made us, as if to say, it seems to me it made us a spectacle to the angels, to the, uh, to the universe, and to people. At the end of the position, as men condemned to die in the arena. What used to happen was, I mean, the position precision goes back to, say, for example, Rome. Then uh, the heroes will be entertained by the uh, king, and the prison will be put in the prison. 
and they put in the arena and uh, they send the lions into the arena, the Roman Colosseum. Every, everywhere they did it. Because the Roman rule was there, the Greek rule was there. And then the people who were really heroes for God were actually treated badly by the people who did not understand why these people are doing what they were doing. So on one side we are in the eyes of God so special as eyes of the world very often we are the scum of the earth. In fact, Paul goes on to say in the previous verse, we had to go to the aroma of Christ among those who say among those who are perishing. To the one, we are the smell of death, those who are perishing. To the other, the fragrance of life. To those who are saved, we are the fragrance of life. To those who are perishing, we are the smell of death. I don't think even the devil likes the smell of death. No one likes the smell of death. No? So because the same Christian is a fragrance of life to those who are saved, smell of death, death to those who are perishing, we face mixed reactions. Some will love us, some will be so happy with us, some will curse us. So we should know how to respond to various reactions to our life and to our ministry. The 11th chapter of Hebrews records the amazing things people did by faith. The entire chapter of 11th chapter of Hebrews is about the heroes of faith. Uh, Elias's names are mentioned there. And you go to the last few verses of the chapter, uh, 11th chapter of Hebrews, verse 38, 39, 37, 38, 39, 40, we read, uh, about this, uh, after talking about the amazing sufferings they all faced, how much they are persecuted, all these people, heroes of the old. In uh, verse 38, the writer says, they were commended for their faith. They were commended for their faith. But none of them received what was promised. They were all commended by God for their faith, but none of them received what they had promised. God had planned something better for us, that only along with us, they have been made perfect. They have been given promises. Only in heaven, one day when we are all gathered together, God will give each one of us our rewards in heaven. They were commended for their faith. But the promise is not fulfilled for them in this earth. And also the previous verse is written there about these people who suffered so much for the Lord. He said, the writer says, the world was not worthy of them. The world was not worthy of them. They are so special to God, so precious to God, heroes to God, but to the world, scum of the earth, refuse of the world. 1 Corinthians 4.13. So how do you look at yourself? You feel bad that people reject you, scum of the earth, refuse the world. They, you know, they slander, slander you. They curse you. They persecute you. What does Paul say? When they curse us, we bless them. When they persecute us, we endure. When they slander, we speak kindly. We refuse the world, scum of the earth. But to God, we are so special. It's so very important for us to always look at ourselves with a godly perspective. I'm going to look at this as per responding to reactions from three perspectives. Our beliefs, our lives, and our teaching, our speech. First of all, let's take beliefs. Uh, when it comes to our beliefs, we must understand one thing. We believe in Jesus. Most people in this world are under the control of the evil one. We have to understand that. We look at people, why they react to us, why they are angry with us, but we must understand that behind them there is a spirit that controls them. 2 Corinthians 4, 4 says, the God of this age has blinded the minds of unbelievers. Our enemy is not people. Our enemy is the evil one. The God of this age, the God is small g, not capital G. He is blinded. 1 John 5, 19, John writes, 1 John 5, 19, Be your children of God, and the whole world is under the control of the evil one. So our belief in Jesus will not be understood by people. Because they cannot imagine how anyone can say that Jesus is the only way of salvation. He says that, John 14, 6, And when we are faithful to that amazing truth, the profound truth, which is for every human being in the world, people don't like it. Because they feel they are being very parochial, very narrow-minded, and 
they have some other belief system which is very popular. Oh, everything is same, all religions are same, always different ways go to heaven. It's a very popular belief. I mean, accommodate everybody. It says in the book of Proverbs, 14 chapter verse 12, there's a way that seems right to man, but the end it leads to death. It seems right to man. To say, oh, all everybody, everybody can find his own way to go to heaven. Don't look down on somebody else. We don't look down on people. But they cannot accept the belief that is against God's word. When you believe in Jesus, we believe in what he says. He says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. In John 8, 24, he says, I've told you, you will die in your sins. But don't believe I am the one I claim to be. You will die in your sins. So the very fact we believe in Jesus as being the only savior of the whole world, in Acts 4, 12, it's written, salvation is found in no one else, for there's no other name under heaven given to men by which you can be saved. And therefore, this belief in the, the words of the Lord Jesus Christ will not be accepted by everybody because they belong to the evil one till such time they call upon the name of Jesus. Our duty is to get awareness of how when they call upon the name of Jesus, they will be delivered from these forces. Till they call upon the name of Jesus, you can't expect them to understand our belief. So don't expect everyone uh, to understand your beliefs. Of course, when you believe in Jesus and we live for him, our lives will change for the better. We will be loving, compassionate, gracious, holy, humble, teachable, all that is there. But then this is a spiritual fight. It's a spiritual blindness. Can you imagine anyone hating Jesus? Is a personification of holiness. Personification of love. Not an iota of sin in him. Yet he told his own brothers in John chapter 7, verse 7, the world cannot hate you, but it hates me because I testify that what it does is evil. Imagine the world hating Jesus and he's telling his own brothers who are not believers in him at that point of time. The world can't hate you, but the world hates me because I testify what the world does is evil. To you and me, Jesus says to his, his, his disciples in John chapter 15, from verse 18 to 20, if the world hates you, keep in mind it hated me first. If you belong to the world, the world will love you as its own. As this, you don't belong to the world. But I've chosen you out of the world. That's why the world hates you. So when you take a stand for the Lord, you'll be rejected. Accept the rejection. In a Jewish family, when one person believes that this Jesus is the Christ, he will be thrown out of the family. That's the understanding of 10th chapter of Matthew. Many people ask this question on the Bible. 10th uh, chapter of Matthew, in the last few verses, Jesus says, I have not come with a sword. I have not come with a uh, bring peace. I come with a sword. I have not come to bring peace. I come with a sword. I come to divide a family. Mother-in-law against uh, uh, daughter-in-law, father against son, divisions in the family. And people wonder, how can he, how come he's come with a sword? He's the prince of peace. I've not come to bring peace, he says. What does he mean by that? The word peace means oneness, oneness. In a Jewish family, most Jewish, Jewish families are very, very clannish. They're very close-knit. Even now we see all over the world. Always Jews are very, very clannish. They're a minority in the whole world. So they're very, very fond of each other. It's good. So the family life is very, very close-knit, Jewish family life. When one person in the family chooses to believe that Jesus is the Messiah, they cut off from it. That's why the blind man's parents, when the Jews asked him, asked them, is this your son born blind? Was he born, born blind? Was he healed? They tell the authorities, ask him. He's a, he's a, he's a, uh, he's a grown man. He's of age, ask him. So they were scared when they say yes, he's a believer in Jesus, they were thrown to synagogue, outcast in society. Synagogue, synagogue was a place of fellowship for the Jewish uh, culture.
They'll all be together. As a, like in, we have in Delhi, community centers. In every colony, have community centers. Any function, they'll all join together, celebrate, and all that. So those days, the synagogue was not just a place of teaching. So the place of teaching, no doubt, also a community center, where they'll all meet and have fellowship. And being cut out of the synagogue was a big insult to the family. So one person becomes a believer in Jesus, that Jesus is the Messiah, then cut off. So Jesus says, there's peace in your family. One is, when I come and you believe in me, there will be divisions. The soul divides the family. One person says, I'm the Messiah. Others say, no, there's divisions. That's the meaning of that passage. He came to divide because when he put Lord above everything else, about everyone else, he'll honor us. Proverbs 16, 7 says, when a man's ways are pleasing to God, he makes even his enemies live at peace with him. You always wonder no? that, you know, after all, we follow Jesus. It's a wonderful thing to love enemies, to show the other cheek when someone has the right cheek, nonviolence, love, compassion, they're wonderful things. When someone manifests all these qualities, how come others don't like the person? This is a spiritual warfare. The evil one does not want others to understand our belief. So they'll try to find some fault in our belief system to attack us. So because of faith in Jesus, the divisions in the family among the Jews, even today, when you put a trust in Jesus and call upon his name and say he's the only way, because that's what we call to speak the truth, people attack us because of our belief system. They'll mock us, jeer us, Look down upon us and we should not mind it at all because it's part of our calling. Rejection is part of Christian calling. Rejection for the right reasons. In 1 Peter chapter 2, 4 and 5, we read, Peter writes, As you come to him, the living stone, rejected by men, but chosen by God and precious to him. We also have living stones being built a spiritual house. To be a holy priesthood, offering spiritual sacrifice acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. So as you come to him, he was rejected by men, but chosen by God. God chose him to be the savior, sent to the world, but rejected by men. In the same way, as we come to him, because of belief in him, our belief system, we be rejected by people. There's no logic in all this. It is a spiritual warfare. So we should not be surprised when people hate us. In 1 John chapter 3, verse 13, is written, don't be surprised if the world hates you. You should be surprised. And sometimes even Christians can behave in a worldly manner. They'll hate us sometimes because they're not right with God. The previous verse says that, you know. To Christians, John writes, 1 John 3, 12. Don't be like Cain, who belonged to the evil one and murdered the brother. Why do you murder him? Because one action were righteous, were, 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 were evil, brothers were righteous. Cain's actions were evil, brothers were righteous. Is everything right with God? He got wrong with his brother Abel. And therefore, God's word says to Christians, believers, don't be like Cain. 1 John 3, 12. Next verse says, don't be surprised. So some Christians behave like Cain. Hopefully they are like Abel, pleasing to God. When you're like Abel, don't be surprised when people are supposed to be walking with God are against you. Because your beliefs are strong. You live by what you believe and that people don't like. And behind them is a spirit that keeps on accusing us. Now, <clears throat> The Bible talks about the evil one in Revelation 12.10. They accuse the brethren, accuse them before God day and night. The accuser of the brethren. Now the word uh, Satan actually means accuser. The word accuser. In Job chapter 1 verse 6, first time read the word Satan in the Bible. Job chapter 1 verse 6, where it says, when the angels of God appeared before God, Satan also came. And the word used for Satan there actually means accuser. He accuses the brethren. Today, he accuses us. 
because we belong to Jesus. And since many people of this world, majority are belonging to the evil one, he will use people to accuse us. How do we respond? Revelation 12, 10 says, the accuser of brethren, accuser before God day and night. 11th verse says, they, meaning brethren, they overcame the devil, they overcame him by the blood of the lamb and by the word of the testimony. We overcome the evil one by the blood of Christ and the word of our testimony. Meaning, testifying to what the blood has done for us in terms of our guilt. When the accuser accuses us, what happens? If you listen to the accusation, feel guilty. Accusing, accusing, accusing. Feel guilty. Oh, I've done wrong, I've done wrong, I've done wrong. How do you overcome the evil one? By the blood of the Lamb. By testifying to people, to the devil, and to ourselves, our own spirits, what the blood has done for us. The blood has cleansed us of every sin. Hebrews chapter 10, verse 22 says, Heart sprinkled to cleanse us from a guilty conscience. Heart sprinkled by the blood of Christ to cleanse us from a guilty conscience. Hebrews 10, 14, we made perfect by a sacrifice on the cross. By one sacrifice, he has made perfect forever those who are being made holy. So we have victory in the name of Jesus. And therefore, when people of this world accuse us, they will use them to accuse us. Don't get carried away by their accusation because we believe in Jesus and that belief is reflected in the way we live. So first of all, they attack us because of belief system, belief in Jesus. They don't believe, so they accuse us. And we have insurance against this accusation because there's no guilt for us today by the blood of Jesus. The second aspect is reje rejection, reactions to what we speak. When we believe in the word of God, we speak the word of God. Second Corinthians 4.13 says, Second Corinthians 4.13 is written, Paul writes, I believed and therefore I have spoken. The same spirit of faith we believe and therefore speak. When you believe in Jesus, we will speak what he spoke. We won't compromise on God's word. When you speak the word of God, again, people don't like what we say. The Lord Jesus Christ testified to the world what the world does is evil. So they hated him. So when you speak God's word, while it's fragrance to those who are saved, a smell of death to those who are perishing. And therefore, many will not like it. Some will love, some will hate. Some will accept us, some will reject us. Because we are the fragrance of life to those who are saved, smell of death to those who are perishing. So Christian life is not a popular day contest. We speak the truth in love and leave it to God to speak to people, to make them understand what he's saying is right or wrong. What he's saying is from God or not. Let them, let them understand. God make them understand. In John 6, 45, Jesus says, everyone who listens to the Father learns from him will come to me. Everyone who listens to the Father learns from him will come to me. So when we speak God's word, because we speak God's word, again, we'll get rejected. In Luke 10, 16, the Lord gave a simple solution uh, to understanding of when people don't accept what we say, how we should look at it from the godly perspective. In Luke 10, 16, he told them, if anyone listens to you, he listens to me. If anyone rejects you, he rejects me. And when he rejects me, he rejects the one who sent me. So don't be surprised if people reject what we say, who are they rejecting? Not you, not me. The Lord rejecting. If they accept what we say, they're accepting the Lord. Praise God for that. We shouldn't get too carried away by a response, a favorable response to what we speak, nor get depressed when people reject what we speak, because it's not our word, it's God's word. Please never forget that. The word of God is exactly what it is, the word of God. 
not your word or my word. He has given that word to us. The ambassadors, they speak that word. We speak in love. And they can't expect everyone to accept what we say. In fact, in 1 Corinthians 2.14, Paul writes, the man without the spirit does not accept the things that come from the spirit of God. And their foolishness to can understand them because they're spiritually discerned. So when we share the word of God and we reject it because of the word of God, don't take it to heart. Respond in a godly way. Pray for them. Be polite in responding to their response, their reactions. And please don't fight with people either about gospel sharing or even about doctrines. See, we face two kinds of people. Those who are not safe, we share gospel with them. They get angry sometimes. They react negatively. On the other side, we talk to Christians about doctrines, about teaching. They don't like it. Different doctrine they have. They fight with us. Either way, please don't fight. We should respond with gentleness and respect. In 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 24, Paul writes, And the Lord's servant must not quarrel. He may be kind to everyone, able to teach, not resentful. Those who oppose him, he must gently instruct. In the hope, God will grant them repentance, lead them to the knowledge of the truth, to come to the senses, and escape from the trap of the devil who has taken them captive to do his will. So when someone opposes what you say, you don't fight, you don't quarrel. Law servant must not quarrel. I remember uh, more than 40, in, uh, 41 years ago. In fact, the day after tomorrow is my spiritual birthday. I was born again on 25th of May, 1980, 41 years. And uh, Nirmal Kumar was there uh, in, the, in the church where the pastor, he prayed for me to accept Christ. And going, we're going to have celebration, not celebration, just Thanksgiving prayer on Tuesday, Bible study, when we meet on Tuesday. Nirmal Kumar is here also on Zoom. And when he, was, when he shared the gospel with me, I got angry. He was so polite. No argument. Polarity explained to me that Jesus is the way. He smiled and said he's the only way. He smiled and said he's the only way. And I didn't like it. But I checked out the Bible. I read the Bible for a year and, and God convicted me. So no point arguing. No point shouting. No point raising up. Because that's not God's way. The Lord's servant must not quarrel. Simple statement. The Bible is so simple. No? It's for children. It's for humble, teachable people. Law servant must not quarrel means must not quarrel. We'll find people who try to provoke us. The evil one knows if we lose our cool and start fighting, we'll lose that peace. In fact, we will give a, a foothold to the devil. When you get angry, when people don't accept what we say, sometimes our pride gets provoked, we get angry. They're giving the devil a foothold. Ephesians chapter 4. 26, 27, written there. In your anger, do not sin. Don't let the sun, don't let the sun go down, still angry, and do not give the devil a foothold. As you share the gospel or you share the word of God with some other Christian, when they oppose us and you get angry, you're giving the devil a foothold. And the evil one knows. Other man, anyways, in a devil's control, he wants to provoke you, he wants to jump on top of you. I will give an example, and then I pick on this no? I Very often I find in the, in the um, worship time, among young people especially, there's one uh, very nice song uh, they sing, action song. It goes like this. I have sitten underneath my feet. Uh, based on Romans chapter 16, verse 1920, uh, where Paul writes, God will soon crush sitten underneath your feet. So they sing the song, action song. They stand the ground. The, the, the whole group will stamp in the ground. They'll say, I have sitting underneath my feet. But actually, after seeing that song wonderfully and everybody enjoying, you go and get angry with somebody and shout at them, where's the devil? Not under your feet. He's on top of your head. Because he gave him a foothold. So he's actually having quite a laugh over many Christians. They sing all the wonderful songs. But then, they get angry, lose the cool, where is the devil? On top of the heads. So no point getting angry. 
Don't be surprised if people oppose what you say. Speak the truth, speak in love, and you'll find people don't accept what you say. Leave it. Pray God will make them understand. They grant them repentance. They come to the truth. Knowing the truth is by revelation. We can't give revelation. Only God gives revelation. We can't convict anybody of sin. Only God convicts people of sin through the Holy Spirit. John 16, 18. You find someone caught up in a sin, pray the Holy Spirit convict them. No condemnation for anybody. Convict them. And based on what you say, you convict them also. You do your part. God will do his part. So we have to know how to respond to people who react to our words. Number one, to our uh, belief systems. Don't be surprised when people reject you. You will respond in a loving way. Number two, to the words we speak, because whatever we believe, we have to speak that. They can't compromise on God's word. On Thursday, I spoke about that actually. And uh, Titus 2 7, you can go to pick out and look at the uh, message. Listen to the message. This is a continuation of that actually. That I spoke on integrity in teaching. Integrity in teaching. When you believe something, you teach it with integrity. No compromise, no masala, no deception. Simply speak the truth in love. Leave it to God to convict. Be reactions. There be any reactions. Don't get carried away by the reaction. Simply present the truth in love. Leave it to God to convict that person of whatever you said. And the beautiful thing is, when you testify, be it gospel sharing to non-believers, be it communicating the truth to a believer, word of God, teaching God's word, we're never alone. We're never alone. Holy Spirit testifies as we testify. In John chapter 15, 26, 27, Jesus says, When the counselor comes, whom I will send you from the Father, the Spirit goes out from the Father, he will testify about me. But you also must testify because you've been with from the very beginning. You must testify. He'll also testify, meaning you are never alone. As we testify, he testifies. So when you speak and go away, that's not the end of the whole salvation process. God won't give up. He'll keep on testifying. So we can rest in the Lord and don't get unnecessarily upset when people reject what we say or get too excited when people accept what we say. Simple formula Jesus gave us. Luke 10, 16. If anyone listens to you, he listens to me. If anyone rejects you, he rejects me. The one rejects me, rejects the one who sent me. So why are we feeling bad? Don't feel bad. That's why there's no nervousness when you share the word of God. You know that? There's no nervousness. Oh, how will people like it? It's not your, your recipe. You know? It's not your concoction. It's from God. And people sometimes, sometimes get surprised. I tell them, uh, brother, do you want to get nervous when you speak to a lot of people? I said, no, I don't get nervous. Why, brother? How come? Because it's not my word, it's God's word. I listen to God and I speak out as much as I can. How people perceive it is up to them. I must be faithful to listen to God and speak out. For all of us, the same truth is valid. Isaiah chapter 50 verse 4. As arise, the sovereign Lord has given instructed tongue to know the word that sustains the weary. He wakens me morning by morning, wakens my ear to listen like one being taught. So, share what God puts in your heart and don't worry about the responses, reactions. Be polite, be gentle. Leave it to God to convict them, to convince them what I'm saying is true. So the second part of, our, uh, of uh, reactions. One of the first one was belief system. They don't like it. Second is the words we speak because they're based on our beliefs. Third is be rejected as, as, a, as a person. They reject you Personally, it's a personal attack. And that's also very, very hard for many people to accept. And remember one thing, it's not about us, it's about him. It's about Christ in us. Paul says, Galatians 2.20, I have been crucified with Christ. I no longer live, but Christ lives in me. The life I now live in the body, I live a faithful son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. Don't take it personally when people have personal insults against you. For a moment, you may feel bad. Give it to Jesus. 
He'll handle it. He gave a simple blank check for every one of us. Matthew 11, 28 to 30. Come to me all of weary and burden I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon yourself and learn from me. For I am gentle, humble and hard, you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy, my burden is light. When people make a person insult against you, they reject you as a person, as a human being, and it's a person insult to you, don't take it personal. You <laughs> give it to Jesus. Lord, if I'm going to think about this, Lord, I'm going to be burdened. I'm going to weary my mind thinking about what this person said about me. I'm giving it to you, Lord. You handle it, Lord. You handle it. Just imagine if you are in the position of Saul, going to Damascus, on the way you meet the Lord Jesus Christ, bright light, hear a voice. Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? Why do you persecute me? He didn't ask, doesn't ask him, why do you persecute my disciples, my people? Why do you persecute me? Paul is, Saul is confused. Who are you, Lord? Who are you? I am Jesus, another whom you are persecuting. I am Jesus, another whom you are persecuting. You are persecuting me, not my people. Meaning, when you persecute my people, you are persecuting me. And he goes on to explain, Jesus to Saul, it's hard for you to kick against the goats. When you persecute my people, you're persecuting me. When you persecute me, it's hard for you because you're kicking against the goats. What is the goat? G-O-A-D. It's a small prick, an iron piece, which people use to drive a bullock cart, to, to poke the bulls to make it go fast, to goad it. Goad. It's hard for you to kick against the goat. Imagine you kick against an iron piece, pointed like a diamond iron piece, triangle, sharp. Who gets hurt? You get hurt. So when people persecute Christians, they're hurting themselves. They're not persecuting Christians, they're persecuting Jesus. So when people say mean things to us, pray for them, give that hurt to Jesus, don't take it to heart. Don't take the hurt to heart. And you pray for them. Say, Lord, they don't know what they're talking about, Lord. Reveal yourself to them, Lord. First Peter 3, 9. Don't repay evil with evil or insult with insult, but with the blessing. They may inherit a blessing. For this you are called to inherit a blessing. So many Christians get very, very upset when they are insulted personally because they think, oh, I've changed so much. I've become a nice person. After becoming a believer and such a nice person, I become everyone knows why this man is not recognizing that. Why can't he also praise me? And you know, it's basically ego. And people said bad things about us, straight to us, or behind our back. When we get hurt, what is hurt is our ego. Our pride is hurt. That pride has to be brutally killed. Like Paul says, I am crucified with Christ. I no longer live. When the I lives in us, it gets hurt. Or people say, but it's natural to get hurt. Okay, give it to Jesus. You would say, Lord, I'm giving it to you, Lord. You handle it, Lord. They perceive you, Lord, not me. You live in me, Lord. And let your life be manifest through me to people. Please never forget Christ lives in you. Everything that bothers you, give it to him. Sometimes people get upset about false allegations. Because false allegations mean that uh, reputation is gone. False allegations. Not true about me. How can they talk about me like that? That's not true. How did Jesus tell us to handle that? Matthew chapter 5, 11 and 12. Matthew 5 chapter, 11 and 12. Blessed are you when people insult you, persecute you, and force say all kinds of evil against you. Rejoice and be glad. For great is the reward in heaven. For this is the way they pursue the prophecy of before you. When people make false allegations, rejoice and be glad. It's not true. Why focus on untruth? I know many Christians, when they make, people make false allegations against them, they get so upset. They can't have sleep that night. Sleepless nights. Oh, he said that about me. It's not true. Why does it about me? It's not true. Now, when you focus on that, it's meditation. What is meditation? Focusing. Why meditate on falsehood? It's not true. It's not true. Why meditate upon that? We made it upon the truth, the word of God. 
All the allegations are father allegations. And God is not a spectator in that. He will vindicate us. Psalm 135 verse 14. God vindicates his people. He has compassion on servants. So don't take it to heart. If he bothers you, give it to him. Lord, you take this, Lord. I am going to focus on your call in my life and let your life be lived through me, Lord. What will be a reaction to our belief system, to our words we speak, or to life? Don't take it to heart. We can choose to live a life that pleases God all the time. When you do that, some will love you, some will hate you. I think if you look at yourself in the head of the position or at the back. Before God, you're in the front. Hero. Because you're doing his will. He's so pleased with you. He wants to show you off to the world. The universe, he wants to show you. But for the world, for the world, we are at the end of the position. They jeer at us. Paul Rice, no? It looks like we are at the end of the position. Like men condemned to die in the arena. Go to the arena, then they let in the lions and you die. Like that, we are. And he says, you are honored, you are dishonored. We are weak, you are strong. We are fools for Christ, you are wise in Christ. When people uh, persecute us, we endure. We endure when they persecute us. When they slander us, we speak well of them. That's, that's the response to reactions of people because they don't like your belief, your words and who you are in Jesus. It's part of life for all of us. All of us are called to be people who always walk with the Lord, obey Him in that process. Don't get upset by reactions of people. And Paul goes on in the 13th verse, we are scum of the earth, refuse of the world. For the world, smell of death to those who are perishing, fragrance of life to those who are saved. But what matters most is who we are to God. We are God's children. We belong to him. Purchased by his blood. And that's more than enough for us. More than enough. So ministry is wonderful. Wonderful to serve God. And not react to uh, reactions. Respond in a godly way. Knowing fully when you go home one day, God will say, well done, good and faithful servant. Let's pray. <clears throat> Heavenly Father, thank you, Lord, for each one of us, Lord. Thank you, Master, you called us to believe in you, Lord, to speak your words, Lord, to live for you, Lord. And whatever we do, Lord, there are people who criticize us and attack us, Lord. Others love us, Lord. Most of all, we want to thank you, Lord, for who you are to us, Lord. That's what matters. We want to please you, Lord. Not please men, but God who tests our hearts. Make each one of us, Lord, a display of splendor, Lord, in this world. Your workmanship, Lord. Help us always be conscious about who we are to you, Lord. And not lose focus of the calling you have for our lives, Lord. I want to thank you. I want to praise you. I want to give you glory, Lord. In Jesus' precious and matchless name, I pray. Amen. 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 God bless you.